Muscle physiology. There are four parts. We'll begin with muscle structure, then we'll go on to excitation contraction coupling, which is how the excitation of the nerve tells the muscle to contract. Then we'll talk about muscle metabolism and the energy used for contraction. And finally, we'll discuss some variations from skeletal muscle to how cardiac and smooth muscle work. For the muscle structure, this is specifically about skeletal muscle. Muscles have several layers of connective tissue within and surrounding them. These wrappings of dense regular connective tissue is to separate muscle from adjacent tissue, bundle muscle cells into group, and wrap each muscle cell individually. The end portions of all three connective tissue layers extend beyond the muscle and fuse together. This is the tendon. This fused bundle of dense regular connective tissue binds with the connective tissue on the surface of the bone, the periosteum, to attach the muscle to the bone. Tendons are usually round and rope-like, but when a tendon from a muscle is wide, thin, and flat, as occurs with abdominal muscles or the IT band, it is called an aponeurosis. Let's look more closely at the three distinct connective tissue layers. The outermost layer covering the surface of the muscle is the epimysium. Looking at a cross section of a drawing of the muscle, you can see that inside it there's many bundles. However, the epimysium is only on the outer surface. The whole muscle is made up of many groups or bundles of individual muscle cells. The next connective tissue layer, the perimysium, wraps these bundles and separates them from each other. The drawing depicts the bundle of muscle cells wrapped together. These bundles are called fascicles. The perimysium surrounds and holds together the many fascicles within a whole muscle. The innermost layer wraps around each individual muscle cell inside a fascicle. The endomysium is just on the surface of a single muscle cell, right by the cell membrane. To review, the epimysium surrounds the entire muscle, the perimysium wraps around bundles of muscle cells, and the endomysium goes around a single muscle cell. The end that extends beyond the muscle itself fuse together to attach to the bone as a tendon. Here we go from the whole muscle down to a single muscle cell, also known as a muscle fiber. We see the whole muscle is wrapped in epimysium. We see fascicles are wrapped in perimysium, and an individual muscle cell is wrapped in endomysium. Each muscle cell must have a nerve connection to stimulate it. For skeletal muscles, the stimulus begins with the brain, as these muscles are voluntary. The impulse travels down the spinal cord and out the spinal nerve, and then to branch onto individual muscle cells within a whole muscle. A single nerve, called a neuron, Branches to stimulate a group of muscle cells. This is called a motor unit. Notice every muscle cell still has its own nerve action, but one single nerve can control more than one muscle cell. Areas where fine movement and dexterity is required, such as the fingers or face, um, have muscles with very small motor units to allow for precise control of the muscles. Areas that are used primarily for motion or strength that have, have one neuron serving hundreds of muscle cells. These have very large motor units. Each end of the nerve that interacts with the muscle fiber is called a synaptic terminal. There are several names for this region, actually. The relationship between the synaptic terminal, or the end of the neuron, and the sarcolemma, which is the muscle cell membrane, is known as the neuromuscular junction. Zooming into the neuromuscular junction, we can see how the nerve will activate the muscle. The components of a neuromuscular junction include the end of the neuron called the synaptic terminal. This contains small packets called vesicles that are filled with a chemical acetylcholine. This is one of many types of neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is a type that activates skeletal muscle cells. The nerve does not touch the muscle. 
it just hovers over it. So there's a gap or space between the end of the neuron and the surface of the muscle. The sarcolemma is the muscle cell membrane that has receptors for acetylcholine to bind to it. Once the neurotransmitter acetylcholine binds to the muscle receptors on the surface of the muscle, the sarcolemma, that is what's going to stimulate the muscle. That stimulus must get transmitted inside the muscle to ultimately cause the release of calcium inside the muscle for the contraction to take place. The steps for activating a muscle at a neuromuscular junction begins with an electrical signal traveling down a nerve. This causes acetylcholine to be released to bind to the receptors on the sarcolemma. That will depolarize or activate this muscle cell membrane, which just means it has become more positive and is thus activated. This activated stimulus is then being transmitted inside the cell via T-tubules. These are adjacent to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is these, the yellow weave-like structure that it contains calcium. This stimulus coming from the T-tubules will go to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and release calcium. It is this calcium that is actually going to activate the muscle to start the contraction process. Looking at a single skeletal muscle cell, we can see that it is long and cylindrical. These types of cells are some of the longest in the body as a single muscle cell extends the entire span of a muscle. This is why skeletal muscle cells have many nuclei so that the cell can maintain itself across such a long distance. Because of the length of the muscle cell, they're often more frequently called muscle fibers. Inside a muscle cell or fiber, it's clear that it's tightly filled with long columns known as myofibrils. We see them as many cutout circles indicating the ends of these numerous columns. These columns are what's contracting by pulling the ends of the muscle together. The muscle ends are attached to bone on either side, so the contraction can cause a joint to move. Let's look more closely at the myofibril after we identify the other important elements of the muscle cell. The cell membrane of a muscle is called the sarcolemma. The cytosol or fluid inside is called the sarcoplasm. Myoglobin is a protein that is found in the sarcoplasm which helps to bring more oxygen into the cell for energy production. T-tubules are electrical fibers that cause the entire muscle cell from the outside deep to the center inside to be activated all at once. The sarcoplasmic reticulum contains calcium. It is like a calcium pouch wrapped around each of the cylindrical myofibrils. It is the release of calcium out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that activates the muscle to start contraction. And relaxation is when the calcium is returned back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The myofibrils of a muscle cell contain the proteins that work together that are actually doing the pulling of the muscle causing a contraction. Let's review. The cell membrane is called the sarcolemma. Cytosol or cytoplasm that is not really seen here is the sarcoplasm. T-tubules conduct the stimulus inside the muscle from the surface membrane. The sarcolemma to the yellow web-like structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a storage site for calcium, which when released, starts the contraction, and when taken back, stops the contraction. The many cylindrical rods, with an enlarged one at the bottom of the image, are myofibrils. Inside of them are the myofilaments. Now that we're comfortable with the terminology of the parts of a muscle cell, let's go deeper into the components that make up these myofibrils. These are the areas of the muscle that's doing the contraction, so the details here are really important. So the myofibril are all these rods within a muscle, but the myofilaments are the basic protein components inside. When we expand a portion of a muscle cell, we can see that the interior of the muscle is dominated by the many rods of myofibrils. Now, looking at a single myofibril, we can see colored patterns and stripes. 
The patterns are made by the dark and light colors of the myofilaments. Myofilaments are organized into repeating units called sarcomeres. They go from one green zigzag line to the next green zigzag line. Now look back at the muscle cell and see if you can see the faint dark and light strips. Those are made from sarcomeres that are lined up in a row like train cars. The Z lines are made of actin and form the ends of sarcomeres. Let's look at this repeating pattern of a sarcomere. The Z line is made entirely of actin. The light band along the myofibril is shared between two sarcomeres. The darker color is myosin. A myofibril is a series of sarcomeres attached end to end at their Z lines. When the muscle contracts, the myofibril will shorten by pulling on the actin. When the muscle contracts, the myofibril shortens by the myosin pulling the actin. So notice the dark bands stay the same. It's the light bands that actually get smaller during a contraction. There are two types of myofilaments. The thick filament, which is darker and thicker, is called myosin. The thin filament, which is lighter in color, is called actin. The arrangement is the myosin or thick filament is situated in between the thin actin strands. The actin is anchored at the end in a zigzag pattern that is aptly named the Z-line. A sarcomere is the unit from Z-line to Z-line. The unit is repeated down the entire length of the muscle. How this works, we'll see is the myosin will attach the actin and pull the Z-lines toward the middle of a given sarcomere, making the two Z-lines come together. So we see a Z-line, myosin is in purple, and the actin here is in green. There are several bands and lines with names. I bands are only actin, they're the light regions. The Z line is just the center of the I bands, so it's the end of the sarcomeres. The A bands are the dark regions. They are made of mostly myosin, but there's some actin within it that's overlapping. And finally, the M line is the center of the A band. From a sarcomere, we'll break it down into the actin and myosin to see how the Z lines come together. This is where we can see Z lines coming in together. Notice the myosin stays the same, but it's pulling the Z lines in together, and this is how a muscle shortens. Actin strands, the green, are made of a series of beads, each with a binding site for myosin. When myosin binds, contraction occurs. In order to control when myosin binds, there are these regulatory proteins or these little brown ropes that are covering up the binding sites. Uncovering and recovering these binding sites on actin is what starts and stops the force production. This is controlled by two regulatory proteins called troponin and tropomyosin. Tropomyosin looks like the rope wrapping around the actin beads, covering up the binding sites, preventing myosin attachment when the muscle is at rest. Troponin is the controller and controls the position of myosin. Troponin are shown in blue, and they're these small proteins placed about every seven actin molecules, and they're hooked on top of tropomyosin. Troponin binds to calcium. When calcium is released out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and into the sarcoplasm of the muscle, it's going to go straight for troponin, which is going to cause troponin to shift over tropomyosin, and then the active sites on actin are going to be exposed, and then myosin will start to bind, and that's going to begin the pull of the Z-lines coming together. Myosin is made of many, many individual molecules that are bundled together. Each one has a long, thin, bulbous head. The molecules are arranged on either side with their tails pointing toward the middle, and the heads are out to attach and pull on actin. It is these heads that were pulling on actin that brings the Z-lines together. Myosin moves. This is the molecule that makes the force happen. 
Each of the myosin molecules can lift, they bind up to an active site on actin, and they pivot and pull. So myosin has a binding site to attach to actin, but it also has a binding site for ATP. ATP needs to be there to reset myosin after it has lifted and pulled on actin. The myosin can lift upward. And as you recall, in a sarcomere, actin is just next to myosin. So there's a specific binding site for actin on the myosin head. Once it lifts, it will bind to actin. This forms a cross bridge. Once the myosin connects and binds with actin, the head will also pivot. As it rotates, it's pulling on the active strand. Hundreds of these little heads pulling on actin on each side of myosin is what's going to cause the muscle to contract and the Z lines coming together. ATP made by the cell is required to reset myosin. If there's no ATP around as it occurs in death, myosin is going to remain attached to actin and this is what rigor mortis is. But good thing we have ATP because the myosin can then get reset. When ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate, the cross bridge is energized and it's ready to go again. It's like setting a mouse trap. The energy is imparted into the cross bridge in the resetting of the head. What you should know for muscle structure is the connective tissue layer surrounding the muscle, how those layers form tendons and ligaments. You should know the parts of a neuromuscular junction, the role of a nerve in activating individual muscle cells, and what a motor unit means. You should know the parts of a muscle fiber, also known as a muscle cell. You should know the role of troponin and tropomyosin, how they activate to stimulate contraction and how they block contraction from happening during rest. And you should know the important components and regions of a sarcomere. Now, with all of those things we've just learned, we'll put it together in the process of contraction and relaxation, as well as going through the phases of a twitch and types of muscle contractions. In this schematic, the sarcoplasmic reticulum can be seen with the calcium as pink dots inside, the green beads of actin with the rope of tropomyosin, and the blue dots of troponin. The thick filament myosin is at the bottom with the heads down. When all the myosin heads are separated from actin because tropomyosin is covering the binding sites, the muscle's at rest. There's no binding taking place. When the muscle is activated by a neuron stimulus, the T tubules depolarize and stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing it to release calcium into the area around actin. This calcium binds to the regulatory protein troponin. This causes tropomyosin to move over, exposing actin's binding site for myosin. When tropomyosin shifts over, the active site on actin is exposed. Once that active site is exposed, myosin immediately lifts and binds to actin. The joining of myosin and actin is called a cross bridge. When the myosin head binds to actin, the cross bridge head will pivot, pulling actin over. This movement of actin is the contraction or muscle shortening process. Cross bridge heads detach and reset with ATP. This cycle will continue as long as calcium is bound to troponin. Let's see this on a basic level, bringing the sarcomere together. To review, when a muscle is stimulated, the sarcolemma is depolarized, which depolarizes the T-tubules and causes the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which binds to troponin, which moves tropomyosin, which allows myosin to bind to actin and cross bridge cycling occurs until the stimulus stops. This causes the Z lines to pull together, ultimately shortening the whole muscle. Here it is in a basic list form. Now for relaxation, 
Calcium must be removed from troponin. This is accomplished by pumps specific for calcium on the sarcoplasmic reticulum that's pumping the calcium back into it, out of the cytosol, off of troponin, and back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once calcium is removed from troponin, tropomyosin shifts back over, covering up those active sites on actin again, and myosin is no longer able to bind and form cross bridges, so the muscle relaxes. Here we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum has calcium pumps. These pumps use ATP to suck up the cytosolic calcium. This creates a gradient that removes calcium away and off of troponin. When calcium moves off of troponin, it unbinds and tropomyosin covers up the active sites again and now calcium is back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum Active sites are covered up by tropomyosin, and myosin is reset, and the muscle is in its relaxed state. The force-length relationship of a muscle fiber really just means when a muscle is in a really shortened state, if it's already as pretty short, we can see overlapping from either side of the sarcomere, which kind of gets in the way of cross bridges, so it's not going to make as much force. At the very bottom, we can see stretched out muscle. So the muscle is fully extended and actually overstretched. Not all cross bridges have a place on actin to bind, so it's not going to have maximal force. You will make maximal force right in the middle where you have all cross bridges binding to actin. The phases of a twitch or a single stimulus where we go from stimulating the muscle, contracting and relaxing has actually three phases. There is the latent period, everything we talked about, activating the sarcolemma from the nerve, going down the T-tubules, going to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, releasing calcium, binding to troponin, moving tropomyosin over. That happens in the yellow portion of the graph. That's known as the latent period. So that's a lot of things that happen before the muscle even contracts. Now, the orange portion is where the actual contraction takes place, where the cross bridges are bending and pulling on actin, bringing the Z-lines together. That turquoise or bluish part of the graph is when calcium is getting pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum removing from troponin and these active sites are covering, being covered up in cross bridges are no longer binding. When we want to increase the force of contraction, we can do more motor units, of course. But for a single motor unit, you can actually rapidly stimulate a muscle. And if you stimulate a muscle before it all the way relaxes, as we can see in the graph on the right, you can make the next twitch bigger than the first twitch because you're actually compounding and building on the calcium that's being released. So before all the calcium gets brought back in, a second rapid stimulus allows for extra calcium to be put out onto the troponin, making more cross bridges. When you maximally stimulate a muscle cell so that no relaxation takes place, eventually all the calcium from sarcoplasmic reticulum is dumped into the cell and you will have maximal force production. This is known as tetanus. The other, where you're just building on one twitch to the next, is known as wave summation. The types of contraction that you need to know are concentric or eccentric. Those are the moving muscle contractions. Concentric is when you're lifting the barbell up. You're shortening that muscle. Eccentric is if you're still holding that barbell, but you're allowing it to go down very slowly. So you still are using your muscle, but you're allowing it to elongate while you're extending your arm out. That's known as eccentric contraction. If you're holding the barbell, and not moving, but you're contracting, your muscles working, but it's not shortening or lengthening, it's just staying in the same place, that's known as isometric. So what you should know is, what are the processes of contraction? What's going on with the sarcoplasmic reticulum 
and the calcium and the troponin and the tropomyosin and then the myosin cross bridges and how they pull on actin and the role of ATP in resetting the myosin cross bridge. So you should know about that. You should know that relaxation takes place when those pumps on the sarcoplasmic reticulum are removing calcium off of troponin. Tropomyosin covers up the active sites. Myosin's no longer allowed to bind. Now the muscle can relax. You should know that there are three phases of a twitch. There's the latent period where all of the calcium and the binding unbind and tropomyosin moving is taking place. Then you have the contraction phase where cross bridges are happening. And then you have the relaxation phase. You should also know how to activate a twitch to make greater force. A single twitch can be rapidly stimulated or stimulated before all the way relaxes to build on the previous calcium level, increasing force in wave summation. You should also know that if it's stimulated so maximally that it never gets a chance to relax at all, you'll get all the calcium out and you'll have maximal force in a state known as tetanus. You should know the difference between eccentric, concentric, and isometric contraction. So muscle metabolism is about the energy in contracting a muscle. We have creatine phosphate, glycolysis, as well as the mitochondria as sources of ATP or energy for the muscle. Creatine phosphate is just a flash in the pan. It's just a rapid, very immediate source of energy. So it's nothing that's really usable for any sustained type of exercise. Glycolysis happens out in the cytosol, and it's known as anaerobic because it doesn't need oxygen, but it really doesn't make that much ATP. Really, glycolysis makes some components that go into the mitochondria, and it's in the mitochondria that we actually create a lot, lot more ATP. We need glycolysis and, and what's going on in the mitochondria to work together for maximal energy production for sustained activity. We have two types of fibers, well technically three. We have slow twitch fibers and we have fast twitch fibers. And technically the third one is an intermediate that's a little bit of both, but we'll just stick to the slow and fast. Slow twitch fibers are there for sustained exercise. They have lots of mitochondria. It's churning out energy for a long time. It's for the like marathon runners. It contains myoglobin. We mentioned this a while ago, but what myoglobin is, is it's inside the cell. It makes the cell darker. So if you're looking at a turkey or chicken, it's the dark meat. It's this dark muscle has myoglobin because it's pulling extra oxygen out of the blood into that muscle so it can actually make more ATP because of the mitochondria inside. Fast twitch fibers, however, are only working for short bursts. It's for rapid, quick movements and high strength, but not for a long duration. So these fast twitch muscle fibers can hypertrophy or enlarge so they can accommodate greater strength, but they fatigue very quickly. So the dark meat in a turkey is really slow twitch, where the white meat in a turkey is fast twitch. So the breast meat in a turkey, because they don't fly around very much, is the white meat. That's their short burst of energy. But turkeys are walking around all day long, so it's the thigh muscles that have the dark meat. So that's the slow twitch muscle fibers. So you should know the, in muscle metabolism the role and needs of mitochondria. Well, mitochondria needs oxygen, and mitochondria is where we have most of our energy made. But elements from glycolysis out in the cytosol go to the mitochondria in order for us to get all of the energy. So they really work together. You should know how ATP is produced. You should know the differences between a slow twitch muscle fiber and a fast twitch muscle fiber. Finally, let's look at some differences with cardiac and smooth muscle. There were three types of muscles. We've already spent a lot of time on skeletal muscles, so we'll look at some of these other differences and we'll 
in particular, we'll figure out how cardiac muscle can actually increase the force. Must, there are three types of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, cylindrical cells known as fibers, they have many nuclei, they're striated, and they're voluntary. Cardiac muscle, on the other hand, is also striated like skeletal muscle, but it only has one cell. It can conduct electricity within it, and it's involuntary. Smooth muscle is also involuntary, but it's smooth, no striations, and these ones are found around organs and vessels. So cardiac muscle is self-activating. There's no nerves that require, no nerves are required to make it work. Now nerves can increase or decrease its rate and force of contraction, but you can also work a heart just fine without any nerves attached to it at all. It has intercalated discs which help conduct electricity through it, and the main thing to know is it increases the force by stretch. Well, it doesn't really stretch like a rubber band, but when you have more blood coming back to the heart and it fills more, like when you're exercising and you're returning more blood back into the heart, it stretches out a little bit like a water balloon, and that stretch activates more troponin, causing more cross bridges to form. So stretching will increase the force of contraction in the heart. That's known as the Frank Starling Law. Smooth muscle goes around organs and around lumens with spaces. So for instance, like your bronchioles or your gut tubes. And so it is involuntary, it does not have troponin, it contracts in a really peculiar way, which we won't go through. You should just know that it is involuntary and it surrounds many organs. So you should know the differences between the three types of muscle in terms of is it voluntary, involuntary, does it have one nuclei or does it have many nuclei, is it striated or is it not? You should know the frank starting law of the heart really means that when a heart muscle is stretched by being filled more with more blood, it causes more cross bridges to form and that causes it to create more force.